Hello, and uh, thank you for inviting me to do this talk tonight on new approaches to understanding back pain. I'm Alan Breen. I'm a professor of musculoskeletal research here at the uh, AECC University College, and also in the Faculty of Science and Technology at Bournemouth University. Ranged around the picture of the AACC University College, uh, where we have a center for biomechanics research, you can see the logos of some of the other university centers that we collaborate with. Most of our work in the Center for Biomechanics Research is on back pain, which depends on many disciplines for an understanding that's anywhere near complete. Before we start, you'll see that my slides are numbered, so if a question occurs to you that we can answer in the, in the, in the question period, and it pertains to a particular slide, please just make a note of the number if you'd like me to bring it up. So in this talk, I'm going to cover how our understanding of low back pain has evolved, recent initiatives towards understanding it better, how patients can benefit from our new understanding, and how we can improve our understanding further. So it's a kind of a past, present, and future type of talk. So why do we need new approaches? Well, probably because all the old ones are not working very well, if this article in The Economist last January is anything to go by. Back pain is a very expensive condition. It costs the UK around 13 and a half billion pounds per annum, plus three and a half billion in treatment costs, most of which is paid for by the patients themselves. So low back pain is the world's largest cause of disability. Most of it has no diagnosis. There are many treatments, but there's no cure. And that's a summary of what the Economist article says. Well, why no diagnosis? Well, if you contrast back pain with other medical conditions, for example, stroke, what you find is that while a stroke may be due to a blocked artery, like this one, you can also see when it's unblocked, so the mechanism is clear. Another example might be peptic ulcer, where if you do an endoscopy, you can see the ulcer, and if you isolate the organism, you could have something to kill off with antibiotics, so you have a diagnosis again. If you go to back pain, here's a picture of the inside of the back. And so what do you see? You basically see the anatomy, which is usually not badly disrupted, as is the case with almost, back, almost all back pain. No clues beyond that. You have vertebrae, which could be fractured, but they're not. You have discs that could be infected or ruptured, but they're not. You could have a spinal cord with a tumor in it, which there isn't. You could have nerves that can be trapped, but hardly ever are. So where does that leave us with most back pain? It leaves us in ignorance of the causal mechanisms behind the pain, a diagnosis. And that's where we've always tended to be with low back pain. All the way back to ancient times, there were treatments for back pain. Examples are shown in this drawing of ancient Greek manual therapy for a neck problem, ancient Chinese treatment for a low back problem, ancient Roman treatment for, I guess, a curvature, which I think they're trying to squash with a board. Anyway, that reflects our approach to low back pain treatment throughout most of human history. As you can see, it was seen as a mechanical problem mainly, and this has persisted. For a long time, the main people who attempted to treat it were bone setters, and that persisted too, all the way through to the 18th century when the anatomists appeared. This is John Hunter, an Irish anatomist and erstwhile philosopher, who declared that back pain is, is due to abnormal movement. We shall call this instability. If we stop the movement, we shall cure the pain. So the idea of stopping movement came forward, but there isn't really any way of totally stopping movement in the spine. Even if you put people in courses, it doesn't completely immobilize the spine. Here's a picture of a lumbopelvic fixation uh, with metal rods uh, on two radiographs. This doesn't happen, and this didn't happen until two centuries later when x-rays and anesthetics and spinal surgery weighed in. And even then it was only uh, reserved for the most extreme cases. Moving forward to the industrial revolution, this old engine is meant to symbolize the exertions of trying to build railroads, especially across North America, which was the source of a lot of injuries. And that was not the only source. They were the mines, the mills, the factories, the Navy, the merchant marine and all the other pursuits that underpinned the expansion of the British Empire, and that brought injuries. 
But back pain became increasingly associated with injury, for which the only treatment was the same as for the common goal, to go to bed, stay there, hope that someone will feed you, and you will eventually be able to get up again and work again. Because if you don't, there were only meager sources of charity to keep you alive. As a result of this, bed rest became the standard treatment for low back pain throughout the 19th and early 20th centuries. Meanwhile, the theory of the loose back persisted right up through the 1970s, as you can see from this article by two New Zealand orthopedic surgeons. This is Russell Hibbs, a New York surgeon, considered to be the father of spinal fusions. He performed the first corrective surgery for spinal deformity, which happened to be due to TB. And you can see that this is done by putting screws and rods alongside the spinuses of the, of the vertebra. By that time, the bone setters in North America had given rise to the osteopaths and chiropractors, who then had a formal education and a chance of recognizing a serious underlying illness. In the course of understanding spinal fusions, which started in the early 20th century, two more American surgeons called Mixter and Barr, when they were doing a fusion, discovered a disc that had been ruptured um, and one of their, in one of their patients during this operation. You can see it here on this MRI scan. That enthused surgeons to look for such ruptures in people with back pain. And many came to the conclusion that all real back pain was due to slipped discs. And this was the next fad, and it persisted throughout the 20th century, but it didn't stop the now rapid increase in low back pain disability in Western society. Here's a picture of a graph published by the Department of Health depicting the rise in incapacity due to low back pain in the UK. This was over the period from 1995 to 1993, 1955 to 1993. As you can see, there was a very steep increase in sickness and invalidity benefits over that period. In the mid 1980s, I was a young chiropractor who'd done some epidemiological research at Manchester University. I was doing a PhD in biomechanics at Southampton. Around then also, the Department of Health was asked by the House of Lords Science and Technology Committee to recruit a cross-disciplinary group of back pain practitioner scientists to serve under its clinical standards advisory group. The job was to prepare a report to advise health ministers on the current standards of care and access and availability of services to treat back pain. Because this was now costing 13 million working days per annum, which was even more than strikes at that time. These practitioner scientists were few and far between, and they found a surgeon who had done a great deal of epidemiological research supporting an American guideline on back pain, a nurse who had done population prevalence studies, a GP who was an officer of the Royal College of General Practitioners, and me. They gave us 10,000 pounds to spend, so we asked York University Center for Dissemination and Reviews to summarize the epidemiology of back pain in the UK for us. And that was very helpful. It was uh, formed the basis of our investigations, which led to our report in 1995, this report here. Well, what this basically said was that low back pain can be divided into three categories. Serious pathology, which is very rare. Nerve root pain, which harks back to the disc hernia thing, which is also rare. And non-specific back pain, which makes up the vast majority of the rest, which constitutes a big black box. Not surprisingly, our advice was to concentrate attention on the non-specific variety, because that's where the main impact was. Now, around that time, the model of healthcare itself was changing. That was partly the instigation of a psychiatrist in Rochester, New York. In the 1970s, he published a paper because he was alarmed at the suggestion by his professional colleagues that society should become more medical and less sociological. What is the point, argued George Engel, of doing a prefrontal lobotomy on a housewife with depression if her husband's beating her up every night? Psychological and social factors can be as important to the outcome of a distressing condition as physical ones can. This publication in the journal Science got quite a bit of attention. It was called the Biopsychosocial Model of Health. Now, the surgeon in our group recognized this and said, ah, this looks like it could apply to low back pain. Well, regulatory instruments were already come into place that were discouraging the concept of injury because they were preventing injury. 
because the factors that were known at that time to predict their outcome were now largely psychological and social ones. So you can see a couple of the latest uh, of these instruments on this slide. In 1992, the manual handling regulations and then 2012, the Health and Social Care Act. So um, for quite a while now, back pain had no longer been a reason to go to bed. This is a rough diagram of the model that we advocate, the biopsychosocial model of back pain, in which the three areas overlap to account for all the factors that would determine how someone's back pain would turn out. However, this did not contribute to the diagnosis of the condition. The back pain revolution, as it came to be called, transitioned health policy from an injury model to a risk model, but not to a diagnostic one. In other words, it was proposed that the management of back pain should be based on the stratification or classification of patients according to the risk of becoming chronic. In other words, by prognosis. So our main recommendations for treating back pain are here. They were to identify people with serious pathology and nerve compromise and refer them to hospital. To reassure the rest, because a major factor in poor prognosis is fear. Give them a simple analgesia and tell them to try to avoid bed rest and remain active and at work. This is because the research showed that bed rest delays recovery, which is something of a tautology because being in bed is um, by definition a, a disability. Anyway, if they didn't recover, consider referring them for manual therapy, an exercise program or counseling, preferably work-based. Not because these treatments were spectacularly effective, but because they were the only ones with any scientific evidence of effectiveness. But more importantly, 90% of the cost of back pain to society had now been revealed as coming from the 10% of people who became chronic. Most of these costs were related to benefits payments and lost production. People who were off work with back pain for three months had less than a 50% chance of ever going back. And anyone off work for six months had virtually no chance. And last of all, do not perform surgery if there's no serious pathology, which was very much conflicted with practice in back pain at that time, especially in the United States. Well, since this report, a whole set of national and international guidelines based on it followed, mainly aimed at primary care, GPs, where early intervention should be possible. These were from bodies like the Royal College of General Practitioners, um, the Health and Safety Executive, the National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence, and the European Commission. The effort here was to prevent chronicity, which unfortunately it hasn't to any great degree. Now at the same time, the US guideline was published by the Agency for Healthcare Policy and Research, which comes under the National Institutes of Research in America, made broadly the same recommendations as we did, but it wasn't so enthusiastically welcomed probably partly because it was sent out with us without much consultation with health professionals. In fact, it wound up in the US Senate following an action by the American Medical Association which, object, Association, which objected to the constraints on practice being advised. Follow us, following this, the name Agency for Healthcare Policy and Research was changed to the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. No more policy making. I don't believe it ever published another guideline. Meanwhile, in the UK, this graph was revisited when the Department of Social Security became the Department of Work and Pensions. It was found that this steep rise in days and invalidity benefits had been mirrored by a steep drop in unemployment benefits. In other words, many of these people on invalidity benefits didn't have jobs, a great way to reduce the unemployment figures by transferring them to the invalidity figures. Well, by this time, the back pain community, which I was in, was wondering if there was really anything to celebrate in the biopsychosocial model, because the suffering and cost of back pain was still very high. Then in 2009, the World Health Organization in its Global Burden of Pain study named back pain as the number one source of days spent in disability worldwide. So should we really be still advising stratification? by risk of becoming chronic and giving up on diagnosis. Around 2013, the North American Spine Society 
by the instigation of its president, this lady here, along with the National Health and Medical Research Council of Australia, sponsored an expert workshop of internationally leading back pain researchers from around the world to try to answer this. They included scientists, practitioners in the fields of psychology, bioengineering, neurology, orthopedics, physiotherapy, rheumatology, chiropractic, and others. And they came from all over the world. They met in Chicago in 2015, each one presenting their viewpoint while respecting everybody else's. Well, the upshot was that led by these two, Paul Hodges and Yacha Kolowicki, they decided to attempt a consensus, still based on predictors of outcome, but much more comprehensive in terms of the factors that dismiss it, determine it. Well, this was based on something called fuzzy cognitive mind maps, or GEFI models, which were generated by a computer program and based on the main factors that were thought to influence back pain outcomes in terms of pain, disability, and quality of life. By linking them with lines, this is an example of one person's mind map. Pain, disability, and quality of life around the middle, and all these other factors around the outside. For example, cognitive therapies uh, is likely to decrease fear of movement or kinesiophobia, and that's likely to decrease disability and so on. The lines are red and blue, indicating an increase or decrease in the influence of the risk factor. And as you can see, these factors also interact with each other. When you put all these 29 people's Gephi maps together, this is what you get. This beautiful flower arrangement, which was about had 729 categories in it. Um, and that was the time to have another meeting. So this time we met in Orlando in 2017 to discuss what we should do now that we got all these factors and their interactions. We decided to use statistical clustering and consensus workshops to come to a smaller set of categories that we hoped would be meaningful. So there were four of them and you can see them here. There were body structure and function, personal factors, environmental factors and comorbidity. Now that might not tell you an awful lot, so let me elaborate a little bit. Body structure and function included biomechanics, which was always considered important by most people, and then tissue injury and pathology, which was already well recognized. And then nociceptive detection and processing, which was the new kid on the block, based on neurology and how pain is detected and its inputs modified in the nervous system, including as a result of interventions. Then we had the personal factors, which clinicians might not think about, even although the biopsychosocial model hints at them. Individual factors are basically what you get. Are you big, small, strong, weak, young, old? And what's happened to you in your life health-wise? Psychological factors were already extensively studied, and we already knew a lot about them, including the benefits of patient empowerment. Main ones are depression, distress, and fear. And then behavioral and lifestyle factors are all about your life choices. Do you smoke, pursue extreme sports, go to bed late? Are there enough hours in your day? Then the environmental factors of which the categories are social, work and contextual. Social factors are mainly about social status and the freedom to act and control your own life and destiny. While work factors are largely about self-esteem and fulfillment. Contextual factors are all about your culture. What do you believe in? Are you a Spartan or are you an Athenian? On this could depend on whether the next move you make is going to hurt. These are things that clinicians may generally not get into very much, but people in our group of researchers had evidence that they're important to outcomes. The last group is the comorbidities. In other words, do you have anything else wrong with you? This could be something obvious, such as a lower limb amputation but it could also equally require good medical knowledge and a full case history and clinical investigation to find out. So this was a greatly elaborated model of health that would require full commitment if any clinician decided to try to use it effectively. Well, this group published this in a paper in the Spine Journal in January this year. They called it development of a collaborative model of low back pain. The emphasis was on the word collaborative because not only were the 
There are no one-trick ponies advocated here. There were no gurus either. Instead, the paper laid out these factors and the statistical weighting that came out of the analysis, where psychological factors had the highest weighting for perceived importance at 28%, biomechanics, tissue injury and pathology, social work and textual, contextual factors were all around 13%. And then the comorbidities at only about 4%, and so on. And these are all the participants in the workshop, all 29 of them. 29 of them? 29, yes. Um, and their spread of preferences for these factors. So as you can see, everyone thought that there were at least four factors to be considered in back pain patients. So this is the new collaborative model. Let's see if it catches on. But for the rest of this talk, I want to show you some examples of how they can interact using a few examples of people whose back pain was not getting better. To keep it as simple as possible from this point onward, I'm going to only discuss people with my biomechanical factors who are uh, suspected of having instability because that's familiar, it had been going on for centuries. Um, but what I want to do is to think about how this factor links to at least one other in the model. This is how we measure instability in the spine at the AECC University College. We use a technology called quantitative fluoroscopy, which involves taking motion x-rays of the spine and then using computer image processing to decide, determine whether the segments are stable or not. Well, we can hardly ever find any are unstable, even though the ones I'm going to show you are, but we certainly find out other things. So to measure how well the segments are restrained, we bent the, the patient lying down on a moving table. Here he's bending forward. And to measure how well the motion is controlled by the person's muscles and under load, we do it standing up, following a moving arm on a rotating wheel, as you can see on the left. So here's an example, measuring how far and how fast the bones move in terms of tilting and sliding while the patient is lying down. This is the lumbar spine of a 21 year old lady. This is the front, this is the back. These are the five lumbar vertebrae. And she taught keep fit, swimming and yoga. She had suffered with back pain if she stood for any length of time over the past year. And despite all her ex exercise and fitness, it was not getting better. And her clinician wanted to see if any of the levels were poorly restrained. Notice that I've just told you what the personal environmental factors and contextual factors were for this patient, didn't I? The table up here shows the results where a red dot means the movement is abnormal. All the white dots mean the movement is abnormal for those categories. So as you can see, there's a red dot in the, in the box that indicates laxity or slackness during EXT or extension, or backward bending, between her fourth and fifth lumbar vertebra, which is this one here. If we look at her backward bending motion x-ray, you might be able to see that this moves uh, the first, the most, and the fastest. Now, when I play this, uh, it will probably jerk, although the original video is recorded at 15 frames per second. You're not going to be able to see this on a podcast. But keep your eye on this one, which you may see move the furthest. And the fastest. If you can't see it there, it's also obvious on the by the uh, gradient, the high gradient on this graph. And this graph shows all four segments, and this one is this one. The treatment for this patient was to advise her toward just avoid backward bending for a year, to which she objected strongly because it didn't agree with her lifestyle. But she did agree to comply, and she did get better. And when she stopped avoiding bending backwards, she no longer had pain doing so. Here's something similar, although a bit more complicated, in a 57-year-old man who also likes to do keep fit, but had 15 years of recurrent back pain right at the base of his spine here. His clinician also wanted to investigate instability, and this was a side bending lying motion x-ray. The results of this in 2014 but at the bottom level, L5S1, um, both tilted excessively um, 
due to our normative compared to our normative exercise our normative database of values to both left and right um, and it was lax or moved too fast in left bending and in forward bending flexion it also shows that the vertebrae higher up are stiff inside bending and flexion extension uh, and that's uh, denoted by the little bull's eyes that show their shows that their range is much less than normal. You might be able to see that if I play the video. Normally, if you're used to looking at these things, um, you would find as a person bent sideways that most of the movement would be taken up in the mid lumbars. But here, it's mostly taken up at the base. See if you can detect that, even though it jerks. So his clinician used manual therapy to try to increase the mobility of the stiff levels, these ones, and movement training to show him how to avoid stressing the bottom one while still being able to exercise. After a few weeks, he was also much improved, although prone to recurrence if he misbehaved. We also had the opportunity to test him five years later, which showed that although the mobilization of the stiff levels hadn't made much difference, the bottom one was no longer hypermobile or lax. This next one is a 37-year-old tornado fighter bomber pilot who had been invalided out of the RAF with back pain. During the Second World War, he flew sorties from Turkey to Iraq, attacking ground installations in the desert. Unfortunately, these involve eight-hour flights in a cramped cockpit under considerable stress ending in high accelerations and G-forces when trying to avoid enemy missiles. After a time, he couldn't even exit the aircraft on his own when he got back to his base and had to be lifted out. But when he returned to England, invalided out of Iraq, his back pain had continued, especially when standing and slow walking. And his clinician asked for this investigation to see if instability was involved. The results showed that the left side uh, left side bending evidenced excessive laxity and tilting range at three levels for laxity at least. And this is also evidenced in the steep gradients in this graph. The only one that isn't steep is L5S1. Well, this time the treatment was to just to strengthen the muscles on the right hand side of the spine using this isometric exercise. Uh, and also to improve his movement control and aerobic fitness, which worked, provided he kept the exercises up, which, which he didn't after a year. Uh, and his pain recurred and he started them again and his pain went away again. This is the last example. This is a 29 year old lady who liked to run marathons, not this person, it's just an image from the web. When running one, when she was 17, she got severe pain that didn't go away. And an x-ray showed that the lowest lumbar vertebra, this one here, had slid forwards, called a spondylolisthesis. A spinal surgeon used two bone screws to hold it back, and she recovered, only to relapse eight years later when running another marathon. Her surgeon found that the original screws had broken and did a much more extensive stabilization using larger screws and rods that go up the back. He also inserted an artificial disc through the front. This removed her pain, but left her with bowel, bladder, and womb dysfunction. To make things worse, the pain came back after four years for no apparent reason. If this was because the fusion had loosened, a further operation would be the only solution, but carried serious risks. To find out, the surgeon asked for a quantitative fluoroscopy scan, both lying and standing, to investigate both restraint and control between her lumbar vertebra, particularly the bottom one. This slide shows the results, which are, for both lying and standing, that the fusion of the lowest vertebra had not come loose, as evidenced by the little bullseyes there for all the movements, both lying and standing. However, the orange circles shown in the two levels above it during upright left side bending meant that these two levels tilt right when she, when she bends left. You might be able to see this if I play the video. The levels that we're talking about are these ones, which you should see bending to the right and she bends to the left. See if you can see that. A 
again, the movement is jerky, partly because she didn't like bending to the left. And she unknowingly went past the upright position when she came back. Anyway, she was given the good news and recommended to see a physiotherapist who used movement training. She recovered completely and very quickly. This last example is a dramatic illustration how a number of these factors that I showed you earlier were taken into account to help this patient. Now I'd like to show you how we're trying to improve our understanding further from this point. This is inspired by genome research, which makes possible highly individualized assessments uh, by uncovering biomarkers. A biomarker is an objectively measurable factor that correlates with the disease. For example, raised blood glucose can be thought of as a biomarker for diabetes. By revealing a set of them, you can provide a diagnostic combination. So you hopefully wind up with an understanding of the mechanism behind the condition to support a rationale for treatment. Recently, the use of biomarkers has been applied to the problem of chronic pain, uh, the most frequent category, which is low back pain. All we have to do is to deconstruct them, as described in this review. Deconstructing them means identifying their link to the mechanisms of the condition. Over the past five or six years, we've been looking for biomarkers in nonspecific back pain based on patient patterns of spinal motion. And we seem to have found some based on the sharing of motion between the bones when we bend. Lying down, as in this slide, each of the vertebrae takes up a specific and constant share of the motion, which is the same for everyone based on these 103 control volunteers with no back pain. So here we have um, uh, the L45 vertebra, which takes this, the largest share of the motion at about 35%. And I suppose L45, um, which takes up the least, sorry, no, L23, which takes up the least in side bending and forward, forward bending rather. But the thing that's notable is that this, the, the, so the lines are the average and the shading is the confidence interval, which means that this, this is a highly individualized pattern uh, which works for everybody. And so that's called a phenotype. However, in people with nonspecific back pain, the most sharing, this is an example, is both uneven and highly variable. So the motion sharing pattern in controls um, and, its, and its inequality lying down as a biomarker for nonspecific low back pain, and this is the phenotype. The trouble is we don't know why yet. There's also a standing up phenotype and it looks like this. However, this time, although the motion sharing is highly typical in people without pain, each level has its, still has its own characteristic pattern with narrow confidence intervals, which mean all 101 people, healthy controls, uh, are the same in this respect. If we compare this on the left in a smaller sample of people with nonspecific back pain on the right, the, the patterns are significantly different, but in a more complex kind of way. So what we're actually looking at is the motion of each segment starting upright, moving towards full flexion and coming back up to full upright. But to simplify this, we can just look at the positions at the end of bending here. In pain-free controls, all the vertebrae seem to contribute to the motion, this green one. Whereas in a back pain sufferer, the top level seems to take a disproportionately high share and the bottom very little at that point in the motion. But as I said, we don't understand why yet and we're busily trying to find out. There are other back pain researchers um, who've been looking for biomarkers and have found them. For example, chemical markers have been discovered circulating in the blood of people with seemingly nonspecific back pain. Uh, uh, this, the main one is tumor necrosis factor. And this happens in people who have become chronic. There are functional changes in the nervous system that can be detected with functional MRI. The hope is that these effects can be reversed and the symptoms with them using relatively simple but individualized interventions like movement training. Well, to finish off, I'm going to show you a special case of back pain, back pain in astronauts. 
It's not generally known that astronauts returning from a period in microgravity or zero gravity to Earth gravity often get considerable back pain, about 23% of them, and sometimes herniated discs. A few years ago, NASA investigated this and a few astronauts returning from microgravity using fluoroscopy, but it didn't compare them to the situation before they left. And it did the actual testing several hours or even days after they returned from space. So they couldn't find anything, any motion abnormalities to account for their pain. However, it is generally known that the absence of loading allows our disc to swell like this. And this is thought to be behind the pain and potential herniation due to the increase in this interdiscal pressure and the stretching of the outer layers of the disc. So to counteract disc swelling in preparation for a return to Earth gravity, a microgravity countermeasure skin suit was developed at the Center of Aerospace and Physiological Sciences at King's College London. The skin suit is essentially a leotard with stirrups attached to drawstrings that go up to shoulder pads so that when tightened, it produces an axial load on the spine. Last year, we had a research contract with the European Space Agency to see if the skin suit actually did reduce disc swelling. And to create some disc swelling, we asked some of our students at the ACC University College to sleep on a very comfortable waterbed wearing the skin suit, which we tightened up in the last few hours of the night. In the morning, we wheeled them lying down to our open upright MRI scanner and scanned them lying down, not like this, and then into the x-ray room for a lying down fluoroscopy screening. This was followed by the same thing, they're then allowed to get up and stand up, but upright, upright scan, upright fluoroscopy. Six weeks later, we repeated the process, but without the skin suit, and then we compared the two points in time. The result was that the skin suit generally worked. After wearing it, the compression significantly decreased the disc heights and volumes and made them slacker and increase their motion, which is a highly pleasing result. So that concludes my presentation. I hope you found it interesting. The take home messages are brief. The main one is that nonspecific back pain is complex and difficult to treat once it becomes established. So we need to be prepared to recognize and act on a number of factors in any one case. If we don't, we can miss the chance to give truly individualized care. In short, that will require an elaboration of the current biopsychosocial model into the one I've shown you or something like it with more categories. Overall, there seems to be scope for developing a more diagnostic approach if the science continues to support it, including the identification and deconstruction of a range of new biomarkers. I just want to acknowledge our more recent donors and collaborators listed in this slide. And, uh, and then just put up my email address. Uh, feel free to contact me if you'd like to. Um, you'd be very welcome. And thank you for listening.